who is uh, is interested in, is uh, just said that we've known for at least 20 years that those drugs are not effective for treating depression in adolescents, and he's just surprised that it takes so much time before our colleagues uh, get the information. And he said also that Prescrire did a good job warning about that. Yeah. Um, these drugs can be helpful for teenagers who are anxious or teenagers who are depressed. The controlled trials don't give you a good picture of what's going on, partly because controlled trials are blind. They're not intelligent, usually. You have to understand the underlying issues before you can use a control trial to help you. The SSRIs are clearly anxiolytic drugs. And if we ran a control trial, which need only last a week of SSRIs in teenagers to show does it have an anxiolytic effect, um, you'd, you'd be able to show a big difference between the drug and the placebo. And it only need to be a week. Let me give you an example. We ran a healthy volunteer trial among my colleagues. Uh, doctors, senior nursing staff, they were the ones who were at the volunteers for the trial. And one or two days after, I mean, again, these volunteers didn't know they were taking an SSRI. They could take an SSRI or an other drug, okay? And in the case of the ones taking the SSRI, their patients, after two days, were able to notice that they were taking an SSRI. The patients knew what the effect of an SSRI was, that you know, people were, when the drug works for you, they were mellowed. And they were able to say, this man who is usually a prickly customer is now easier to talk to than he used to be before he went on the drug. So, but the issue is when you do a trial in people who are depressed, either teenagers or any age group, it's clear from the results that it's not a clever thing to be doing. We don't know what we're doing when we give SSRIs to 100 people who get the diagnosis depression these days, because really it's not melancholia. We're, you know, we're not giving the diagnosis to people who've got melancholia. We're giving the diagnosis to a mixed bag of nervous problems, and you know, it does no better than just watching and waiting with these people. Alors, peut-être ça vaut le coup de traduire un peu la réponse, je ne sais pas. Euh, ça a à voir avec l'intelligence derrière le fait de faire des essais randomisés contrôlés. David a dit que dans certains contextes, ce n'est pas forcément très intelligent quand on ne sait pas véritablement ce qu'on fait. Et il a dit en particulier qu'il n'y a aucun doute que ces médicaments diminuent l'anxiété et que quand on le fait sur des volontaires sains, après deux jours, les gens savent très bien qu'ils sont sous IRS plutôt que placebo et qu'on observe des effets. Euh, la difficulté, c'est qu'on ne donne pas dans les essais ces médicaments à des gens qui seraient extrêmement déprimés, qui seraient mélancoliques, mais à un groupe pas du tout homogène de gens qui ont toutes sortes de problèmes qu'on a appelés euh, dépression. Et ça peut expliquer euh, euh, les résultats qu'on qu obtient euh, alors que pour certains euh, patients, le, le traitement peut apporter un bénéfice particulier sur l'anxiété. Y a-t-il une autre question avant Oh, what should pharmacovigilance look like ah, then that's I'm t okay, um, there's a text in French for this lecture, which I know some of you have, okay? And I'm going to keep very close to the text, except for this first slide, which isn't on the text. I'm told that you will have heard that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Yes, you've all vaguely heard this, okay? Well, this is economics from Mars and medicine is from Venus. What I'm going to try and persuade you is to look at the world that's usually the world of economics and politics 
through the eyes of healthcare. You'll all have heard of, I'm sure, have heard of the word neoliberalism. There are books about neoliberalism, which is seemingly the major ideology of our days. But in none of these books does it tell you what neoliberalism is. No one's able to explain it very well. What I want to persuade you is that any of you who work in healthcare know more about neoliberalism, have a better understanding of what it is than the economists do. And that might sound an extraordinary claim, but let's wait and see what you think at the end of the talk. Right, <clears throat> several years ago, about four or five years ago now, I slipped in the shower and broke my shoulder. And if you can see the x-ray here, this is a very bad break. There are several bits of bone in places they shouldn't be. Okay, this is on a Friday morning. I had an operation on Friday afternoon that put a plate in my shoulder. I was back at work on Monday morning. This was good for me. It was good for my patients. Uh, it meant that the organization I worked for didn't have to hire a locum doctor to see the patients I was due to see. It was good for them, cause, well, hopefully good for them, because they kept seeing me rather than a complete stranger. It was good for the research I was doing. I was able to keep doing the research. When healthcare works as well as this, it's cost effective. You can provide it for free. And there's no control trials behind putting plates and shoulders. So there's almost no control trials behind anything surgical that we do. But a few weeks later, I get this letter here, which I think helps explain why healthcare is going wrong, why it's, it's going bankrupt, why we cannot afford the health services we now have. You don't need to be able to read the letter. It's an invitation to me because I've had a fracture to get my bones screened. And everybody over a certain age in the United Kingdom and probably here in France, if you have a fracture, you'll get a letter like this inviting you in to have your bones screened to see if there could be any bone thinning that might have contributed to the fracture. And the reason I get a letter like this is because 40 years earlier, 30 years earlier, 35 years earlier, a group of drugs called the bisphosphonates came on the market. And these are bone thickening drugs. And the idea was they were going to be given to women who had osteoporosis. Now, when I trained first, I mentioned, when I trained first, very few people had osteoporosis. But if you introduce bone scanners, which the companies making this, the osteoporosis drugs gave away to free to hospitals like this and hospitals in the UK uh, to help screen women in particular, but they had to be non-sexist, so they screened both women and men, you find that there's a lot of bone thinning. Using bone scans, a lot of people have osteoporosis, and even more people have some bone thinning, osteo Penia, it's called. This is a huge market. One third of women over the age of 50 have some bone thinning. And the invitation from the advert here is if you treat a woman like this, it's rather like putting a plate in David Healy's shoulder. It's going to pay for itself. It's going to be good for her. It's going to be good for her family. It's going to save money. She's not going to go into hospital uh, in the way she would have once done. Now, the bisphosphonate drugs were costly drugs when they came in the market first. But in order to make sure that people got the advantages of these drugs, and the free bone scanners meant that most hospitals put screening programs in place so that people like me, every time we had a fracture, got invited along to have our bones screened. And it costs money to put a screening program in place. And when the screening programs don't reduce the rates of fractures, we put auditors in place to check on what the true rates of fractures are. And 
you know, when the rates of fractures appear to go up, we put managers in place to manage a service that just doesn't seem to be producing the right results. And when you add up all these people, then actually the cost of the drugs is just a very small fraction of the healthcare costs in this area. You hear about high cost drugs the whole time and people complain about them, but industry say, well actually the price of drugs is still 10% of the cost of healthcare, but that's because we now employ a whole load of people to deliver drugs, so employing all these extra people keeps the price of drugs seemingly low. Even, but hopefully you can see that we're spending more on drugs and more on people to deliver the drugs than we were before. If the drugs worked really well, they should be 20% of the healthcare budget, not 10. You know, the healthcare budget should reduce. We should have fewer hospitals and fewer staff, and you know, the price of the drugs would be what it is, but it, will be, it, is, it would appear to be going up. Do you see what I mean? In fact, industry are able to claim you are spending no more on drugs than you were before, which is not true. But um, in the case of the elderly, when things like this come up, the fallback uh, kind of position is that actually, well, this is just aging. Everybody expects as, as they age, they're going to need to be treated for more problems. But <clears throat> before we pick that bit up, let me just show you this. In actual fact, there was no access to the data from the clinical trials of the bisphosphonate drugs. If you have access to the data, you see that there wasn't a reduced rate of fractures as claimed. And in clinical practice, we now know that these drugs cause catastrophic fractures of long bones that were rarely seen before these drugs were used. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. If we abnormally thicken bones, there's a good chance that they're going to go wrong. I mean, it's not a healthy state for a bone to be in. You don't want to be too thin, but you do want a certain flexibility to it. <clears throat> and as on the aging point, here's a cartoon, which is Bart Simpson being consoled by his father, Homer. Bart is having a bad day. He looks depressed. He looks like a teenager who's depressed. And Homer is saying to him, well, look, uh, you know, this is only the worst day of your life so far. And what this suggests is a certain wisdom that we've lost. This is almost politically incorrect these days. Bart Simpson, if he goes to school in the United States and the UK and maybe here in France, will be screened for whether he's got any behavioral problems. And based on the screening, he will get pills. He won't get his father saying to him, you know, you need to toughen up or you'll mature out of this or whatever. That's not what happens. And in children's mental health, we now, when we do all the screening and find that we're not meeting all the needs children have, we put people in to manage failing services. Very recently, the Minister of Health in the UK said that children's mental health is the greatest point of failure of the National Health Service. And that's because the problems are exploding without us really, I mean, the more we do, the worse the situation gets. The point I'm trying to make here, though, is it's got nothing to do with aging. It's exactly the same situation as we have with the osteoporosis drug, drugs, but the, but the aging isn't there to, to, for, as a convenient excuse. What is the excuse? Well, <clears throat> as you've seen from at the previous talk, those, those of you who are here for the previous talk, the literature <clears throat> on these drugs is almost entirely ghostwritten these days. <clears throat> this is a cartoon about a ghostwriter, but this is not what ghostwriters look like. Ghostwriters are mostly women who have PhDs, who are able to work from home on data they're given by the pharmaceutical industry, who write well, who understand the issues, but who are not given the data from the trials. 
Several years ago, 20 years ago, I was able to get into Pfizer's archive and everything was stamped confidential in the archive, even published articles and the toilet paper was stamped confidential. But this document, which is a 60-page document, wasn't stamped confidential, extraordinarily. And this showed you all the articles from clinical trials were done for Pfizer's SSRI, Zoloft, in people who were uh, depressed, in people who were anxious, people who had social phobia, in the elderly, in the young, with all kinds of things. What you see here is the post-traumatic stress disorder page. And you'll see over on the right, they're saying that two clinical trials have been done. One is going to the New England Journal of Medicine, and the other is going to JAMA. These are the premier journals in the field. Th these articles aren't going to obscure journals. They're going to the very best journals. What you'll see over on the left is author TBD. That's English for to be determined. They have not decided yet who the academic names on this, these papers will be. The choice of academic names will not depend on who is involved in uh, the clinical trials. It will depend on who the marketing department think are good names to put on this article for sales purposes. Donald Trump has introduced us to the concept of fake news recently. Well, the greatest concentration of fake news on earth centers on the drugs your doctor gives you. And it's not just the antidepressant drugs, it's the statins, it's the bisphosphonates, it's drugs for respiratory problems and gut problems and for pain. Almost the entire literature on unpatent drugs is ghost written and has been for close to 30 years. What's more recent is that the pharmaceutical industry now have public relations agencies that make it their business to tell you that anyone, David Healy or whoever, who talks about the harms of drugs or the harms of vaccines is spreading fake news. We are the fake news people, not the experts who say these drugs work, who have, haven't actually written the articles. It's a very strange world we're in. So now, I want you to introduce you to um, uh, the politics. This is where the neoliberalism bit of the story begins. I'm sure you all know that uh, the Communist Party begins around Lyon in 19, uh, 1840 or so. But by the time of the revolution in France, which triggered Marx and Engels to write the Communist Manifesto, that there were 100,000 communists in France. Marx didn't create the idea, he just adapted what seemed to be the obvious future force, communism. One of the hints, though, you get from all that, I mean, when you think of, of, of communism now, you think economics. When you think, when you, if you've read the communist, uh, uh, if, if you've read the communist manifesto, you think it's about economics. But a few years before this comes out, Friedrich Engels, his co-author, has written a book about the condition of the working class in England. And Rudolf Virchow was doing the same in Germany. And in particular, Louis René Vierme, before them, had been doing it in France, linked to Paris and to Lyon. He was describing the conditions of silk workers around Lyon and people working in, in at the cotton factories and other laboring, uh, well, intense craft-based industries back then, which were changing as machines got brought in. And he was describing the health problems that the machines and the new factories caused, and also putting on the map the fact that the machines and the factories were causing health problems, but also the wage depression that went with them was causing health problems. The fact that people couldn't afford to buy good food was contributing to their health problems. VMA was the main stimulus, a doctor was the main stimulus to the growth of communism here in France. 
You may know that after uh, the revolution happened and petered out, that the communists decided to leave France. France was a failed cause. There was no way to reform it. And they emigrated to the United States, would you believe, to close to Chicago. And we've seen the results since. OK, the other person who was very big in all this was Rudolf Virchow in Prussia, who comes out with the famous phrase that politics is nothing more than medicine on a grand scale. Let me hop 60 years forward <clears throat> to just after World War I. And this man you see here, George Henry Newman, has become the first chief medical officer in the United Kingdom, in the first Department of Health in the United Kingdom, and he's writing about the state of the nation, the, it, uh, the nation's health, to the Minister of Health. And he's painting a picture of there's a changing situation. We now have the possibility to treat the nation as a garden. And just as you will weed out the weeds, and the weak plants from the garden, we now have the opportunity to create the kind of conditions where we can do that with people and foster the growth of the good plants that are going to make the United Kingdom more economic and better able to compete with Germany and France and, and to occupy the tropics and things like that. This is, I mean, this is an economic argument, but it's a health-based economic argument. It's what underpins the eugenic movements at this time, which are a health-based movement. It's what underpins the later Holocaust, which begins with the elimination of the unfit, the mentally handicapped, the mentally ill, before, we, before the Germans begin to eliminate other people who are not naturally part of the German garden. At the end of the war, World War II that is, Friedrich Hayek writes the book <coughs> that most people think of as been the first um, harbinger of neoliberalism. Hayek says we need to remove the virus of central planning. This is where things are all going wrong. The Germans and the Middle Europeans are centrally planning things. The British and the Americans are much more free market oriented. We need to get back to the liberalism of the 19th century. Now, maybe economic liberalism of this kind could vaguely work, but it can't work in healthcare. You can't let anyone do just what they want. Healthcare is much more like the roads. You know, you can't let anyone drive a car whichever way they want. You've got to have some road signs and some agreed rules. You can't just have a totally free market. So, the other thing that Hayek probably underestimated was that in the United States in particular, the conclusion from World War II was not that we needed a free market, but that the managed economies work better than other economies do. This is Margaret Mead here, who's uh, probably at that time the most famous social scientist in the world. And she has this phrase which lots of people have seen or heard and quoted and which looks inspirational. It's the kind of thing that has people put on their office doors when they want to inspire people to pick up a cause and do things. Nobody knows exactly where she said this and who she was referring to. But Margaret Mead, in 1946, became part of a small group of committed individuals who changed the world. She was part of a group who helped create and put on the map cybernetics. At least that's the word that was used then. The word that would be used now is systems theory, or operational thinking. The idea comes from Norbert Wiener's book, Cybernetics. He says, look, we need to, we've got this new way of thinking that computers do. We've got algorithmic-based thinking. And the very simplest version of that is a 
thermostat, when you know, we can create an instrument when the temperature goes up to turn the heating system off, and when it falls down again to a certain point, we can turn it back on again. This is if x, then y type thinking. And Wiener pointed out that a lot of human biology does just the same thing. And people were seized with the idea that maybe we should apply these kind of models more widely. It gave rise to systems-based thinking and operational thinking. It looked like it might explain why the free market might work. But what I want to introduce you to is this idea, which is when US troops came home from World War II, a lot of the officer class in particular were offered free courses in Harvard and Yale and most of the major universities to do MBAs, Masters in Business Administration. And the science, the new science that underpinned this was all about saying organizations are rather like the diagrams you see here. This one's a very simple one, but if you superimpose these one on the other, you can create an organization. And the role of the manager in this is to manage the information flow, to set benchmarks against, and against which the organization and people can benchmark uh, themselves to audit what's going on, to create a thermostat-like situation. And just a little, little nugget which interests me, and uh, you can respond, well, there's all kinds of responses you may have to this. Most people, when they hear the word cybernetics these days, which is unusual. People don't hear the word, but they do hear the word cyborg, which is a kind of robot. They do hear the word cyberspace, which is all about the internet and computers. The word actually comes from a Greek word, cybernesis, which is the word which gives us gubernator in Latin, and the word government in English, or gouvernement in French. It's about government, which is intriguing. Towards the end of his life, just the year before he died, Wiener wrote this book, which said, look, it was a great idea to introduce you all to cybernetics, but actually, this could be a disaster. Cybernetics works for closed systems, like a thermostat regulating a temperature in a house. It's obviously not going to work in situations where you know, we have awful problems like people having a hot flash. You know, this rare problem that happens to men who've got prostate cancer and they take Lupron. They get a hot flash, you know. We need to be able to cater for, this is a joke, just in case you're wondering what's going on. Poor men who have this kind of problem, okay? Having a fixed temperature system that you can't regulate isn't going to work once things deviate from the norm. And every time people make choices and need to take responsibility, you're going to have situations that will deviate from the norm. And forcing people to adhere to a closed system is not a good idea. By the mid-1960s, just after Wiener died, you got people like Galbraith and a lot of others, as you'll see, getting very concerned about what was happening in uh, the 1960s. In 1958, Galbraith had written a book about the affluent society, which, which was the first harbinger of the freedom, uh, the economic freedom we were going to have during the 1960s. We were free from the wants we had before. People were going to have more money to be able to spend on all sorts of things. It was going to be great. By the end of the 1960s, Galbraith had written a book, The New Industrial State, which said, the freedom I talked about before is not the way things are looking now. We're looking at a very managed society now. Corporations have the power, not just that they don't, that they don't just respond to our needs, producing the goods we say we want. They now create our needs to suit what goods they can provide they can persuade us to want what they can deliver. And the other point you made, which was, we need to look more closely at the managers of these corporations. We've assumed the, um, the US ideology is that these people are entrepreneurs, they're risk takers, and this is going to be good, generally, it's going to open things up. But he said, you know, they're not. The training they have is about algorithms. These CEOs of corporations are 
bureaucrats, not entrepreneurs. At the same time, during the 1960s, something else has begun to appear, and this image here gives you a mistaken image of what had happened. This is the kind of image you'll get if you Google the term service industry. Before 1840 or so in Lyon and in France, most of France worked on the land. Around 1840, there was a slow transition that was happening from people working on the land to people working in the manufacturing industries. So by World War II, most people were working in the manufacturing industries and very few people working on the land. By 1960, in the West generally, the, rate, the proportion of the population working in uh, the manufacturing industries had begun to fall from 60-70% of the population to 10% or less of the population as it is now. And the, most people in uh, the population were working in what is now called the service sector. This is people who work in uh, the hospitality industry, who work in the retail industry, who work in the banking industry, who work in the insurance industry. Up to about the mid-1980s, it did not include people working in healthcare, as you see here with a doctor, and it did not include people working in universities. These were two areas that were not seen as part of the service sector. And the reason, perhaps, you'll see on this slide and the next slide, which is the service sector is all about providing goods to us, like cars or TVs. Is this rain on the roof? Okay. Well, I'll just compete with the rain on the roof. Hopefully, you can hear me clearly. So, uh, the service sector is all about providing goods like cars, our TV programs, our, our fast food. And in the case of McDonald's, they bring out awfully clearly what the service sector is about, which is a quality, what McDonald's does, it provides quality hamburgers. And the quality is that they're the same every single time. There's a change in the meaning of what we mean by quality from a good interaction between two people, or a really good meal, to a meal that's the same every single time. That's what the service industry uh, is all about. For journalists working in the media, it's all about, well, do the public read or watch things about Walt Disney and the kind of movies that Disney produces, or do they read and watch Shakespearean plays? And if the numbers show that people watch Disney and not Shakespeare, then Hollywood and the media actors provide Disney and not Shakespeare. It's numbers driven. Now, there's a problem with medicine from that point of view and why medicine was not immediately part of uh, the service sector, which is in the 1960s and the 1970s and through to about 1990, medicine was all about giving poisons and mutilations, the kind of mutilation that put a, show, put a plate in my shoulder. It's about the... Uh, uh, the magic of medicine is bringing good out of the use of a poison. You can never get a predictable outcome, the same every single time. This is the kind of outcome that the insurance industry simply doesn't understand. It's the kind of outcome that managers don't understand. Managers cannot manage this kind of industry. Again, to bring home the point, this is Herbert Marcuse from the mid-1960s in his famous book, One Dimensional Man, which says that we've moved into a world of doing and not thinking, and a doing that's often driven by numbers. And this was very clear in healthcare because in, at the, you know, in at the 1960s, we began to get capacities to measure blood pressure and measure blood glucose and cholesterol levels in ways that we hadn't been able to do before and hadn't been doing before. But in the 1960s, it was still very much a case of a, an older man like David Healy might have some raised blood pressure, but you're able to discriminate between a benign hypertension as we get older, which may be 
helpful for the aging male brain. It helps push blood up into my brain. It, this is different to a malignant hypertension. And you wanted to treat the one that was a processor malignant hypertension and not the benign hypertension. But we were moving into a world that once we began to be able to measure blood pressure routinely, the numbers began to dictate that we treat regardless of the age of the person or whether we think it's... We stopped making distinctions between benign and process. We just treated the numbers. That hadn't happened during the 1960s. The phrase pecunia non olat, I'm sure you all know, uh, well, it's very much the same. Numbers don't smell either. Um, uh, the 1960s, particularly here in France, was a time of great conflict with people seeing things from different points of view and things were being contested on the street. It was a revolutionary time. And one of the ways out of the revolution was to say, well, look, the rational thing to do is to just stick to the numbers. Numbers don't smell. That was health, but economics was exactly the same. Neoliberalism, as we have it now, begins... The first neoliberal experiment is in Chile when it was called monetarism, which was we'd put a thermostat in place. There was high inflation in Chile in particular. During the 1970s, there was generally high inflation. In Chile, it was very, very high. And it made sense from that point of view to control the supply of money. But what monetarism was about was making the supply of money a thermostat. That when the inflation rate went up, you cut off the supply of money. And it would come down, supposedly. Well. The experiment generally was regarded as a failure. It was bad for people, it was bad for Chile, but thermostats have a logic of their own. And even though the experiment failed, the logic kept going. And that's what neoliberalism is. And as I've said, I think you can see it happening in medicine even more clearly than you can see it happening in economics. And one of the places you see it in medicine most best is in uh, uh, at the mental health field where there are really quite opposing views but everybody on whether they think mental illness exists or doesn't exist these days is forced to come to the dsm table which is you know the uh, uh, a book of operational criteria which says that if bruno meets five of the nine criteria for being uh, uh, depressed, then he is uh, uh, depressed. He might have the flu, which would lead to you meeting five of the nine criteria, but initially when the book was uh, produced, we figured people would make a judgment call that if he has a flu, we're not going to say that just because he meets the criteria, he's depressed. But that judgment opportunity has gone out the window. Now, if you meet five of the nine criteria for autistic spectrum disorder, or depression, or whatever, then you have the condition. And very few professionals are going to have the nerve to say, no, you don't. Very few professionals are going to act like Homer Simpson and say, no, you don't. That's... mental health. <clears throat> <clears throat> That's mental health, but exactly the same thing is happening in the rest of medicine where peak flow rates become the thing that dictate whether you get asthma treatments. People don't look at what's triggering your asthma, they just say we've got great drugs to treat your peak flow numbers, and they treat you. In the same way for hypertension and blood glucose levels. In France, there are the first descriptions of anorexia nervosa. And this happens a few years after the first weighing scales get introduced for people. And later, decades later, when weighing scales 
become more common for people and come with a plate on the front of them telling you what weight you should be, what the ideal weight is for your height. Anorexia nervosa becomes more common. And some decades later during the 1960s when weighing scales become very small and everybody can have their weighing scale in their home, anorexia nervosa and eating disorders become even more common again. And one of the intriguing things about them is they're a Western phenomenon. They're not happening anywhere else in the world. People are wondering about the, you know, what it is about Western women and what's happening to them that's causing this illness. But the best treatment for, for a lot of cases of anorexia nervosa and for eating disorders is just throw out the weighing scales. I mean, as they've spread to the rest of the world, other people have these disorders too. And they're increasingly on your smartphone. We have apps which will weigh how many steps you take, will weigh how you're sleeping, will weigh your emotions. We're going to have a lot more nervosas than we ever had before because when numbers come into your life, they dry, it's very hard to remain wise and say, well, these are just one set of numbers. There's lots of other numbers that I should be taking into account as well. You get, just as an athlete does, you get driven by, uh, by uh, the stopwatch to improve on your time, to improve your numbers. And one of the interesting things about all this is numbers drive our perception of risk. We now have 20,000 articles per year that mention risk in the title or the abstract, healthcare articles that mention risk in the title or abstract of the article. We had almost none before 1970. We now think of risk and healthcare risk has been you know, the kind of thing that people in healthcare must have always thought about. They didn't. Risk didn't exist in medicine before 1970. And the point I'm trying to make here is that, I mean, you'll see it in the corner of the slide, that this is, I mean, the other area where risk appears is the risk of not keeping the GDP growing and the economic data. If the economic data is not going the right way, this is risky for France and for the UK. There are overlapping areas here, and people talk about neoliberalism and risk, but those of you who practice healthcare these days are much more exposed in an intimate way to exactly what's going on than the economists are. <clears throat> the other place where neoliberal thinking comes in, and you might find it as surprising, is in hypnosis. Hypnosis operates on an algorithmic basis. And this is an image of Mesmer here, here hypnotizing, well, mesmerizing one of the women. You see the iron filings, as he thought, going between his hands and her eyes and heart. But in actual fact, it's very much an if X, then Y basis. And this is what the pharmaceutical industry depend on as well. They depend on hypnotizing doctors. Now, you can't hypnotize doctors who are treating a heart attack that's happening right in front of them, or a stroke that's happening, or at least you can't hypnotize them as easily. These are things that don't have quality outcomes. It must be a case of if you do X, you will get Y to be able to induce the hypnosis. And the things that get in the way of that hypnotizing act are an adverse event. If something goes wrong, the hypnotized person, the doctor that is, not the patient, wakes up. If the doctor recognizes the patient is having an adverse event, they have a problem. They can't keep going the way they were. The other things that get in the way of the hypnosis working is if there's personal contact. And this is why it suits industry a lot to have us practicing by numbers. For me to measure your blood pressure rather than talk to you. For me to ask you the questions on a rating scale rather than ask you about whether your daughter has just left home or whatever. And finally, it's a judgment call. The Doctors are the patient's judgment call, but in particular the doctor's judgment call. Uh, that, that's sort of key to whether the hypnosis keeps going. If you want to keep a doctor under hypnosis when an adverse event happens, let's say you become suicidal on an SSRI, 
the adverse event happens, you can let the doctor recognize it's happening, provided you persuade him that this means the patient has a bipolar disorder and you need to be adding in a further drug, at which point the hypnosis deepens. This is just a quick note for me. You don't need to pay too much heed to it. But this is um, uh, 2002. It's in the UK when we had a Labour government. And up till then, everybody thought the NHS, the National Health Service, which was a public health system, was as different to US healthcare, which was a private healthcare system, as you could possibly have. In 2002, the Labour government put guidelines in place. They put a thermostat in place. This is how we treat different conditions. And this allows, this leads to a change in the healthcare system so that the public health system becomes as managed as the healthcare organizations in the United States are. And the experience of both people working in healthcare, doctors, nurses, psychologists, and patients, is almost identical now in the UK as it is in the United States. There's a catastrophic loss of morale in both. The best way I think to explain, and this isn't a great image, if anyone can give me a better one, it'd be great, is that we've now got a supermarket type healthcare for things like risk factors. Again, as I say, when you're having an acute heart attack, this doesn't fit in quite as well. But most healthcare these days is not about acute psychosis, acute heart attacks, or strokes. It's about treating thinning bones and lowering lipid levels and increasing peak flow rates, etc. And it can be delivered by nursing staff and others who are on the checkout. And it doesn't matter whether you see the same person from day to day. Continuity of care is not important. Continuity of data is the key thing. You've got a bunch of people behind the checkout systems who are keeping an eye in case something happens to go wrong. And these are the professionals, the doctors as were. They're not actually seeing patients. They're kind of managing the system. And the true managers of the organization are off-site completely, drawing up the flow charts which produce a situation like this. As one of my patients said to me recently, you know, these days, if I bring my dog to the vet, they get more patient-centered care than I get when I go into, and I'm about to use the word healthcare, but it, this isn't healthcare anymore. When I go into the health service. This is a service industry. It's no longer healthcare. The key time, I would say, I mean, if you want to look at a watershed moment, this is 1990, when all sorts of hazards from the SSRIs come on stream, like people becoming suicidal on Prozac adults, are sexual dysfunction <clears throat> on these drugs. An industry were very successful at saying these episodes, these adverse events are just anecdotes. And the plural of anecdote is not data. The original phrase you may know is that the plural of anecdote is data. And Google wouldn't work if that weren't the case. But industry were very successful at saying the only way to know how a drug is working is through RCTs. And if RCTs would show less than a 5% sexual dysfunction rate on SSRIs, I mean, that's the rate the RCTs seem to show. <clears throat> In fact, 100% <clears throat> of you pretty well, if you take an SSRI within 30 minutes, will have genital changes, either numbing of your genitals or irritability of your genitals. It's everybody. It's much more common than any effect of these drugs on mood. But the RCTs don't show it, so it doesn't exist. If you complain about this to your doctor, you're not seen or heard. It's a point at which people begin to become invisible. Now, I would say the scientific task is if anyone gets put, maybe um, uh, Christine gets put on some dr drug, and she has some awful problem, and she comes in to me, and I haven't heard about this before. And she says, look, this is what's happening to me. Now, I put on the drug, so I'm, not a, I'm hoping I haven't harmed her, so I'm going to be a little wary of what she's saying. I'm not going to instantly believe her. I'm going to want to cross-examine her. But if out of, out the, out from the outcome of that cross-examination, we both end up thinking 
there's no other way to explain the problem other than this drug has caused it, then that's a scientific judgment call. That's objective. And particularly if other patients start saying the same kind of thing, this is solid knowledge. If the evidence base doesn't show that, if the RCT evidence base and the guidelines don't show that, the next scientific task is for me to, and maybe uh, uh, Christine as well, to explain the discrepancy. And you now know that in the case of the SSRIs, the discrepancy arises from the fact that the scientific evidence base, the RCT evidence base, is entirely ghostwritten and there's no access to the data from the clinical trials. When you get access to the data from the clinical trials, you see that the companies ran healthy volunteer trials in which over 50% of the men in these trials had severe sexual dysfunction within the first few days of taking an SSRI. I mean, severe. And several of them had sexual problems that continued after the drug was stopped. But nobody knows about this. The other thing that happens around this time is with RCTs, companies, I mean, an RCT focuses on one thing. It's the effect a drug has, the, the, does it work? And it hides the harms. It allows companies to create a brand in the way that they couldn't do before. They had branded drugs before, but the brand wasn't the same before 1990 as it is afterwards. After 1990, drugs like Prozac and Lipitor and drugs like this become sacraments rather than just drugs with a brand name. They become hyper real. And the other thing that happens closely linked into all of this is that where we were selves before, where Bruno thought of himself as Bruno and I thought of myself as David, we now begin to have identity issues in a way we didn't have before. We're in the, I mean, it's a thing that begins in at the 1960s, but it becomes more marked around the 1990s. We're all in the business of managing identities in the way that we didn't have to manage them before. We weren't engaged in management of our, of our identities in the way we now are. Managing the risk factors to our identity, the things that threaten an identity. So, management got introduced, and this is a point where you might help me. Uh, uh, and the idea, the, the way this was sold was even healthcare, which had been stayed, and it was this funny place where you didn't get good quality outcomes, you didn't know, I mean, you didn't solve heart attacks, you know, uh, in the way we could produce fast food. Introducing management was going to change all that. Managers were entrepreneurs. They were going to foster innovation. They were going to lead. Instead, I would argue what we've had, and this is where I need help, I've created this word, entrepreneur, thinking in the background of George Bush's famous phrase of, do the French have entrepreneurs, if you remember? Uh, well, I need some of you guys to come up with a good word that's going to catch hold. I mean, risk averse. An entrepreneur is a person who takes risks. And, and what we need is a word for the risk avoidant universe in which we now live. The hostile environment where we all doctors and patients have targets on our back in a way we didn't have before. Where managers don't support us, they're the enemy. And this, for me, um, just in case you got confused and thought because I'm speaking English that I'm English, I'm not, I'm Irish, okay? And this is a very famous, it's just, just something to throw into the mix quickly before I change tack and try and give you possible answers, which is, in 1974 in the UK, the IR, well, there were two bombs in pubs, one of which was in a place called Guildford. And several people were killed. And four Irish people were picked up and jailed. And 20 years later, they were still in jail, despite efforts of English people to get them out because it seemed clear that they were innocent. And here's the Lord Chief Justice in the UK at the time saying, you know, if we agree these people were innocent, 
the public will lose confidence in the law. So they have to remain in prison forever. Now, as it turned out, they end up coming out. But that's increasingly the situation anyone injured by drugs here in Lyon will have if they go along, are killed. I mean, if your wife or your parents or your kids or whatever go along after your death or injury uh, and ask the people who run health services these days, uh, you know, what happened? Can you explain to me why Bruno is now dead or whatever? The answer from uh, the managers will be, we've kept to the guidelines. We did nothing wrong. We did everything right. We did everything as the guidelines said. They cannot concede that even though they kept the guidelines that the treatment will have killed the person, partly because with the flow charts, to be able to do that, you've got to have a box in the flow chart which says treatment can kill and injure. And you've got to be able to have a way to handle this outcome. And if you're going to have a way to handle this outcome, you've got to recognize that the injuries that treatment cause stem in part from the fact that the literature's ghost-written and deceives us into giving treatments that maybe we shouldn't be giving. And having a box like that and a process like that is above the pay grade of most, above all managers and all politicians. So how do we solve the problem? Well, here's a cartoon that appeals to me. I don't know whether it'll appeal to any of you. God decides to put guidelines in place. And then on mature reflection decides guidelines aren't the right idea. We don't want evidence-based religion. We want relationship-based religion. I'm going to come down to earth and put things right. We know this particular uh, experiment didn't work out perfectly. But, and linked in to that is this. <clears throat> this is Walter Raleigh, who is a favorite of Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, but he ends up in jail after sh sh she dies. King James I isn't as keen on Walter Raleigh as she was. And he ends up being executed after a trial. Uh, and this is what you see here. This is 1618 when he's being decapitated. Walter Raleigh is convicted on the basis of hearsay. People make claims about things he's done and said, and they're not prepared to come into court to be cross-examined. So the English legal system, and pretty well all legal systems worldwide, change after this. We, no one admits evidence. No one admits hearsay evidence. Randomized control trials are admitted into court. They're not regarded as hearsay even though these days the authors of the trials may, ne may not have been involved in the trials, may never have met any of the patients. The trials happen in India. The patients may not exist. No one can be brought into court to be cross-examined. If an adverse event happens to any of you, to Ariane, for instance, <clears throat> her doctor reporting on this won't include her name on it. So if the same adverse event happens to any of the rest of you and you go into court and saying that EMA have hundreds of reports of this problem happening, the lawyers for the pharmaceutical company will say, this is just hearsay, Your Honor. So the injuries that have happened to everyone else in clinical trials, our clinical practice, don't come into court. The answer to this issue seems to me to be your name. Everybody injured on a drug and their doctor needs to keep their names linked to the report, and that's what needs to go to EMA, and you need to insist on your name remaining there, and you need to have an indication of your willingness to be cross-examined by EMA or in court. If the legal system doesn't acknowledge that kind of evidence, it will break down, because the legal system, its idea of objectivity hinges on being able to cross-examine you. So it cannot continue to function the way it is if you're willing to come into court and be cross-examined. Turning back to Donald Trump, and I'm ending up soon, Donald Trump introduced us all to a concept 
that I think is becoming increasingly important, not just fake news, but after a school shooting in the United States, he said, we need more good guys with guns in all these schools. And a lot of people were horrified at this idea. But he then said, well, if you don't like the idea, why do we have a good guy with a gun outside the White House? And people found this a little harder to answer because the issue is guns work. But we feel that even though they work, if we multiply them up and let them leak into situations that they shouldn't be in, they may cause more problems than they're worth. Drugs and guns are very similar from that point of view. Drugs work, but if we don't restrict them to critical situations and let them leak into all sorts of other situations and multiply up the number of drugs people are on, we risk producing problems that you know, make us wonder if we're doing the right thing. And this becomes particularly clear if you take the gun step one step further. Guns work and bombs work, but there's a limit to efficacy. And the nuclear bomb brought that out, which is we produce a situation where we've got a weapon that's so effective we can't use it. And this is perhaps a good metaphor for, for all technique. All techniques are based on an algorithm. There's an intelligibility to them. They're amoral also. Whether the use of these techniques enhances or, or, or diminishes us depends on us. It's what we bring to the table that counts. In the case of drugs, we've reached a nuclear moment, which is that life expectancy in the United States and in the UK is falling. For the last two or three years, it's fallen for the first time since the medical model gets introduced in France around 1800. Life expectancy increased year on year after that. For the first time, it is now falling. Life expectancy in France and Germany has stalled. No one quite knows what's going on, but one of the things I can tell you is that 40% of the population over 45 is now on three or more drugs every single day of the year. In the 1980s, we were on one drug for a few weeks or a few months in the case of the antidepressants. We were not on antidepressants forever. We were on one drug only. The human body can take being poisoned for a period of time, but it's not made to be poisoned with three or four different poisons every single day of the year for the foreseeable future. Once you're over the age of 65, the chances are you're on five or more drugs. The five drugs there is an average figure. There's some people over 65 who are on no drugs. And what, what it means is that the normative number of drugs that people over the age of 65 are on these days is seven drugs. The pharmacovigilance question I was asked earlier, I said I'd respond to, it was, you know, what about pharmacovigilance these days? Well, pharmacovigilance used to be the focal myelia caused by thalidomide, a rare event where children were born without arms. It used to be the white cell, the plummeting white cell counts in a drug like clozapine, which were rare. But it's now the fact that you are most likely to have a hemorrhage because you are on warfarin or another antiplatelet drug and nine other drugs. You are more likely to end up in hospital from the anti-diabetes drugs you're on and the hypoglycemic episodes you have than you are from diabetes, type 2 diabetes. You are more likely to end up in hospital from falls and fractures than from the consequences caused by an antihypertensive drug than you are to end up in hospital from hypertension. We know that if we reduce the number of drugs you're on from 10 or 15 or 7 down to 5 or less, that you will live longer, that you will be less likely to go into hospital, and that you'll have a better quality of life. This is, I mean, this is at this stage reasonably well demonstrated. Okay, so it looks like in terms of efficacy, people can have most of their cake and eat it. But we can't, I mean, you know, because all these drugs cause, have 
benefits linked to them, you cannot just continue eating cake and nothing goes wrong. You've got to start choosing. We've got to start, start discriminating. We've got to, and this involves a, a better engagement with the people who come to us for help uh, in terms of what matters for them. So I want to just end with this. This is the first slide. I'm just repeating it. I want to change the wording slightly. Then there's another contrast that comes up, which is since the Greeks, we've had reason and we've had magic. And the progress of science is all about enhancing reason and restricting magic. Rationality, in this sense, I want to suggest to you, comes from Mars, and magic comes from Venus. The rationality I'm talking about, though, is very much an algorithmic rationality. It, it's an intelligibility that we can capitalize. We can make money out of the fact that this algorithm works. But if we have too many algorithms in our life, it's going to destroy us. We need to mature to a situation where we turn to m magic. Now, this is not abandoning science. This is the kind of magic I'm talking about is medicine was about bringing good out of the use of a poison. And key to this is an act of judgment. It's being rational in a different sense. It's making judgment calls that are informed by reason, but are not just algorithms. And key to doing this is going to be courage. And we think of Mars as being warlike, and that's linked to courage. But actually, when you look at people who've moved forward adverse events on drugs, people who talk about issues like de-prescribing, the people who are concerned about children being injured, and partners been injured, and parents been injured, they're all women. If you're looking for courage in healthcare, you will need to look to the women, not the men. Thanks. Alors, il y a peut-être des, des questions, des réactions. Je voudrais juste. Euh, préciser quelque chose qui, qui situe un peu le, le contexte aussi de cette intervention de David Hilly, qu'il a très brièvement mentionné et qui sera disponible sur une autre conférence qu'il va mettre sur Internet, euh, qui, est, qui rejoint la question des essais euh, cliniques et de parfois leur difficulté à voir certaines choses qui sont très présentes. C'est la question des effets sexuels sous antidépresseurs, qui étaient donc chiffrés à moins de 5% au début, qui sont passés à 50%, semble-t-il, de façon très sérieuse, enfin, 50% des faits indésirables graves, sachant qu'il l'a dit, 100% des patients sous inhibiteurs de la recapture de la sérotonine voient se modifier leur sensibilité des régions génitales. Et il est impliqué dans un récent travail qui a conduit l'Agence européenne du médicament à reconnaître le fait que certains patients développaient une anesthésie totale des zones génitales qui perdurait à l'arrêt du traitement antidépresseur. Et je crois qu'il y a déjà plusieurs centaines de cas qui ont été rassemblés. Et quand on réfléchit au nombre d'essais qui ont été conduits, au nombre de patients qui ont été mis sous ces traitements, c'est juste étonnant que cet effet n'ait pas été perçu avant, d'ailleurs, pas plus que la fréquence des effets indésirables sexuels. Il y a beaucoup de facteurs qui concourent à ça, semble-t-il. Le fait qu'on ne pose pas nécessairement la question, le fait que les patients n'osent pas forcément le dire, le fait que les patients ne puissent pas être réexaminés, en particulier parce que, ça rejoint la question de la pharmacovigilance, on ne déclare pas forcément les choses quand on en a connaissance. Et pour pouvoir réexaminer les gens, il faut avoir leur nom. D'où l'importance de ne pas... Euh, enfin, de, de pouvoir avoir un système qui déclare les noms de telle sorte... Enfin, les des situations de telle sorte qu'on puisse procéder à des examens sérieux. Dans le cas particulier des effets sexuels, évidemment, c'est encore plus difficile pour les gens concernés euh, d'accepter de témoigner de ce genre d'effet. Voilà, donc ça, ça, 
explique aussi un peu le contexte général de ce, cette remise en question de la capacité des essais cliniques à dépister certains problèmes qui sont pourtant très fréquents. C'est au point où, dans le cas des antidépresseurs, cet effet indésirable est plus fréquent que l'effet thérapeutique. Il y a plus de personnes sous antidépresseurs qui ont des effets indésirables de type sexuel que de personnes qui semblent véritablement aider pour leurs problématiques psychologiques. C'est là qu'on arrive à un paradoxe. Voilà. S'il y a des questions en français, en anglais, je les traduis. Si elles sont en anglais, c'est très bien aussi. Je peux dire en français et en anglais après, si tu veux. Euh, <coughs> Merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Euh, je vais dire en français et après en anglais, du coup. Donc, ma question, euh, c'était, vous avez mentionné dans votre présentation que les effets indésirables ne sont pas explorés, euh, le plus souvent parce que les études sont écrites par des ghostwriters qui n'ont pas forcément toutes les, toutes les données. Et on a eu un cours en fait, dans l'unité de recherche par Michel Cuchera, qui est un des professeurs, euh, qui expliquait qu'une euh, autre raison, ça pourrait être que les essais cliniques randomisés ne sont pas designés pour étudier, pour, euh, étudier les effets indésirables. Ils sont uniquement là pour rechercher un critère d'efficacité. Donc, ce n'est pas forcément dans les critères étudiés. Et euh, il avait mentionné également qu'en termes d'effets indésirables, on ne pouvait pas avoir du tout le même, euh, comment dire, le même niveau d'attente, de preuve, que ce qu'on peut, d'exigence qu'on peut avoir euh, que pour le, le, les données d'efficacité. De, et que par contre, là, la sécurité qui prime, on abandonne complètement les histoires de savoir si c'est significatif ou pas et qu'il y a un effet indésirable, bah, on arrête. Enfin, D'autant plus s'il est grave. Uh, do I translate or... <laughs> So, uh, the first thing to say is that, uh, uh, despite what you've heard here, I give drugs, okay? And I believe in uh, the medical model. I think it's one of our greatest creations. And the answer to these problems is not to throw the medical model out, okay? In fact, the harms drugs cause is often the best evidence we have that that biomedicine must be right in the sense of, you know, we've got a biological factor like an antidepressant making people suicidal. It shows that a biological disorder, as we assume, like, like depression and proper melancholia is, looks terribly biological. Uh, that the, an illness like this can make people suicidal. It's, you know, the best evidence we have that this is the case is when a drug makes you suicidal. But okay, just to come back to controlled trials, You think? Or, let me just quickly add it. I also believe in randomized controlled trials. Okay? Randomized controlled trials are not a problem in a sense. There, there is a place for them. It's a bit like playing golf. If you just got one club in the bag, you're not going to play a good game of golf. You need 13 or 14 different clubs. And from my point of view, the best clubs in the bag are about being able to interview you and cross-examine you. I mean, this is not the only thing, but if you asked me to play golf with one club, this is what I would want to do. I would, key to medicine is practicing relationship-based medicine, not evidence-based medicine. That's not saying don't practice evidence-based medicine, but the relationship is the key thing. And in a sense, I'm in a great position compared with you know, the 1960s where I was the expert who knew all about things and you knew, well, if, if you were the patient, well, and if you weren't the patient you are, you wouldn't know much about healthcare. But these days, I mean, you know, I've got a PhD in uh, the serotonin system, but there are people who've dropped out of school at the age of 16, who have no background in healthcare, who when something goes wrong on an SSRI can access the internet and find out things about the serotonin system that I didn't know that explains, for instance, why they become alcoholic on an SSRI. So we've moved from a world where if, if I take the right approach, rather than 100 patients with problems coming into me, I can have 100 free researchers working with me, well, me working with them. They come back with all sorts of ideas, and I can help them sift out what are the good ideas from the bad ideas, And if things work right, we both learn. It becomes a more interesting kind of job. So where do RCTs fit into all this? Well, I would say when you talk to me about a 
sort of a thing going wrong on a drug, and I have a chance to cross-examine you, and particularly if I talk to a colleague and he says he's had the same kind of thing as well, we end, that's where we get objective knowledge from. Science, when it begins, is all about being able to do something in front of people. And the people might be a Catholic and a Protestant and a Muslim and a Jew and an atheist, but even though they come from totally different positions, if they all figure there's no way to explain what they've seen happen right in front of them other than this is, you know, what is being proposed as the mechanism is, is actually correct. In the same way, I think, when things happen on a drug, we've got people with different ideological points of view. I, I don't want this to happen because I've given you the drug. Ideally, we should have the pharmaceutical industry in the room as well, and they've got a real incentive not to think their drug causes the problem. But you know what? If I report your problem to the pharmaceutical industry, not the regulator, and I leave your name on the report and my name on the report, they come and check your medical record, and they have a look at it, and they often decide their drug has caused the problem, and they include it in the label of the drug under other reports. Most doctors see this and figure other reports means, well, that's stuff that they've heard from people who don't believe the earth is round, or who belong to the Church of Scientology, but actually it's the company conceding their drug causes the problem. So again, I still haven't answered the question, where do RCTs fit in? And RCTs fit in best in terms of deciding does a drug not work? The best answer with an RCT is not, we often don't need to sh use an RCT to show a drug works. In clinical practice, you decide every day of the week whether a drug you're on is actually working or not, and I decide whether it's working or not. You know, we don't, we don't go on just what the RCT says, this drug works. We go on, on a judgment call we both make. In um, terms of wh wh where RCTs, as, as I say, they, they're not great at showing when a treatment really works, but where they're very useful is where there's a disputed treatment, whether we're not, we've got a treatment that it's not clear when I give it to you that it's really making a big difference or not. So we want to recruit 100 people, and we want to put them through a, through a randomized controlled trial. And if the drug doesn't work, that's not because the RCT has come up with, or doesn't appear to work in the RCT, it's not because the RCT has come up with the right answer. The good thing about that situation is it puts the onus back on people who want to make money out of us when we're distressed to find the people where the drug might work and to restrict the marketing to some people who might benefit rather than ensuring these drugs get given to the entire population. Does that answer all of the question or not? Okay. Well, if there's... Uh, I'm not sure I follow you uh, regarding um, the effect of drugs on the risk of a cardiovascular accident, for example, because people with hypertension or with high lipid levels or etc. do not feel bad, do not feel ill. So maybe we don't want uh, to recognize the risk, and but we, we can't. Uh, uh, expect from uh, the feeling of these patients under treatment to, to, to know whether the treatment is efficient or not. So you, in this situation, you, you have to rely on randomized controlled trials. So, uh, so we, we have to distinguish between uh, symptomatic effects from drugs in depression, for example, or anxiety, or pain, but not uh, in, on, on risk factors. And one of the uh, other difficulties in treating some risk factors is the variability of the potential marker of the treatment effect. And maybe you don't want to be uh, protected uh, or to, to, to have your risk decreased. And I think in, in, in the 
uh, modern medicine, this is the main issue regarding uh, so-called shared decision making. Because in preven preventive medicine, uh, decision is never shared because physicians never ask patients what is the level of uh, the benefits they expect from drugs. So in, in general, they are um, failed, uh, believing in a m m more uh, excessively high benefit compared to the real benefit. And that's, that's the main issue. And that's related to your talk in general. But I, I don't think that, um, I, I don't share your point of view re regarding uh, the, the necessity of uh, the requirement for clinical trials. Um, I think they are really needed uh, w when we, we want uh, to reduce the risk. Okay? Right. Just quickly. First of all, <clears throat> Um, there are, you know, the trials that show that a drug which reduces blood pressure uh, reduces blood pressure. You can see the blood pressure fall, right? It takes a much bigger trial that a pharmaceutical company is not going to do for the most part to look at whether reducing blood pressure with this drug saves lives. And the Losartan trial, a very famous trial, show that, uh, maybe, maybe I've got the wrong word there. It was around 1997, 1998, one of the big blood pressure trials shows that we can reduce blood pressure terribly successfully and we don't save lives. The numbers go the right way, but actually we don't save lives. And trials like this are very important because there's often a biological plausibility that opening up arteries in your heart or in your legs is always a good thing to do. I mean, it looks like a rational thing to do, but it doesn't always produce the outcomes we expect. And control trials can be very important in this area. They don't often, we don't often, clinical practice doesn't follow what the control trial says, which is you shouldn't necessarily be using at least this kind of blood pressure pill to reduce your blood pressure. There may be others which are actually more successful. You shouldn't be stenting all coronary arteries, for instance. Okay, sure, we're, um, we're on the same page. I think the key thing about all this is you know, when it comes back to shared care. I mean, one of the things, the point I was trying to outline here is we've come to a point where even if we're just trying to prevent risks, even if you've got no illness, if we're just trying to prevent risks, we can only prevent four risks. We can't present the 30, or we can't prevent the 13 risks that in theory we could actually prevent. We've got treatments for all sorts of things. And it comes down to, rather than me saying, you know, you've got to prevent these risks, it really should be your choice. Uh, you know, what counts for you? It should be, in that sense, relationship-based medicine, you know, where I'm saying to you that, you know, well, there are all these things we can do. And what we've got is we've got a situation now where I'm likely, if you don't know better, I'm likely to put you on 13 different drugs because I'm keeping to the guidelines for diseases are risk factors, and every guideline says, give our treatment for this risk factor, give our treatment for this disease, and what we need is guidelines for people. We don't have guidelines for people, and the first thing that the guideline for people would say is, you can't give more than five drugs, and ideally, you should be giving less, which does introduce the element of choice. Let me just bring one more element into the picture, which you don't hear about. Uh, blood pressure study that happened in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. At the time, there was great fuss. Lots of efforts had been made to get beta blockers on the market for treating hypertension. And the United States in particular was very slow. They, weren't, they, weren't, they, they didn't have it proven to them that the beta blockers were good drugs for hypertension. They since, I mean, they later let loads of these drugs uh, onto the market. But Stepping aside from the control trials, whether the control trials which show that these drugs can lower blood pressure, you know, whether they show that they actually save lives or not. Let me give you a different thing that happened in family medicine. A family medicine doctor in the United Kingdom decided to look at 75 of his and her patients. It was a husband and wife partnership. They wanted to look 
at 75 patients who were put on a beta blocker for hypertension. And in 75 out of the 75 cases, the doctor was very happy with the outcome. Why? Well, the blood pressure fell. I mean, you know, we've no evidence, or he or she didn't have any evidence that this was going to save lives, but the blood pressure fell, and this was a good thing. Only half of the patients were happy with the outcome, and we can wonder, well, why would the patient be happy? It may be because, you know, that they were happy with the outcome because the doctor was happy. It was clear the doctor had a smile on her face when she gave this drug and the blood pressure came down. In 74 out of the 75 cases, I think all the patients were, were male. In 74 out of the 75 cases, the wife was unhappy with the outcome. Why? Well, he was now neurotic because he had been told he had hypertension. And he was now having a range of problems that, were caused, that we know are caused by beta blockers that he didn't happen before. He was having physical problems that he never had before he went to the doctor. Healthcare, healthcare is all about you bringing a problem to me and me helping you. Health services are increasingly in your email or in your postbox, letters come in inviting you to be screened, to get your colon screened, your blood pressure screened, your blood sugar screened. It's about the services giving you problems you didn't know you have because of services they think they can offer you, which is not relationship-based medicine. It's a service industry. <laughs> you know about Dr. Knock? Dr. Knock, you, you don't know, but... Je partagerai une expérience en français, Bruno, si tu veux m'aider après. Je ne sais pas si on n'est peut-être pas très très nombreux. Je ne sais pas si ça. Vas-y, vas-y. Euh, je vais essayer en français et puis euh, après, s'il faut, tu traduiras. J'ai assez récemment fait du coup une expérience de pharmacovigilance puisque j'ai eu un, une situation de traitement, donc je suis pédopsychiatre et j'ai proposé à une patiente qui était là pour anorexie mentale atypique euh, et qui était extrêmement, extrêmement anxieuse, un antidépresseur. Et puis, on l'a mis sous antidépresseur, on était plutôt content de l'effet sur ses angoisses un peu. Puis au bout d'un moment, on s'est rendu compte qu'elle avait vraiment des choses qui étaient inquiétantes, qui nous paraissaient du registre de la mélancolie. Donc ce qu'on appelle, enfin en clinique, on dirait, enfin moi je dirais en tout cas mélancolie forme dans la présentation de ses idées. Et cette présentation très mélancolique, euh, au bout d'un moment, elle perdurait alors que tout allait mieux. Son poids, sa capacité à sortir, sa, sa, ses relations familiales, on avait beaucoup fait évoluer de choses. Et régulièrement, de façon assez cyclique, de toutes les deux trois semaines, un état mélancolique qui arrivait. Puis un jour, la, une, une infirmière qui était là me dit, euh, mais euh, au fait, euh, on parle souvent des traitements et de leurs effets indésirables, mais du coup, est-ce que là, l'antidépresseur, il ne pourrait pas être en cause ben, J'ai regardé dans la boîte et puis j'ai vu, il y avait marqué... Euh, accentuation paradoxale des idées suicidaires et voilà. Je dis bah écoute c'est pas mal ce que tu dis ce qu'on va faire c'est qu'on va regarder s'il si, euh, y a une imputabilité intrinsèque c'est à dire est-ce que y a, euh, le médicament pourrait avoir été mis en place de telle façon que les idées mélancoliques soient survenues à peu près au bon moment mais ben, c'est le cas c'est à dire qu'on a regardé euh, on avait en plus un courrier euh, on va dire inaugural de cette présentation mélancolique puisque c'était un, une veille de week-end où tout était foutu et c'était presque, vraiment, quand j'ai vu ce courrier la première fois, je me suis dit, waouh, elle est en train de partir, elle va loin. Et, et c'était délirant, enfin, c'était vraiment du registre du délire. Et donc, ce, ce traitement-là, euh, on, on, on l'a laissé encore pendant trois mois, et régulièrement, ça revenait jusqu'à ce qu'on ait fait cette enquête d'imputabilité intrinsèque euh, et extrinsèque, et on s'est dit, bon, ben, on va falloir qu'on fasse une fenêtre thérapeutique pour voir si ça joue. Ben, ça fait deux mois qu'elle l'a plus et ça fait deux mois qu'on n'a plus les idées délirantes. Donc du coup, c'est quelque chose qu'on s'est dit, ben, ça, ça vaut peut-être le coup de le signaler, parce que je n'avais pas, moi, d'expérience <coughs> d'apparition de discours péri délirants et donc probablement très suicidogène, euh, parce que complètement déconnecté de la réalité. Le seul truc qui l'a sorti de ces idées délirantes, c'était de rencontrer sa famille, ou, enfin, ou qu'on la prenne à contre-biais et que quelque chose vienne faire une épreuve de réalité très forte et la sorte complètement de ces idées euh, mélancoliques. Mais ça, ça marchait, mais ça revenait toujours au bout d'un moment. 
on a retiré la, la posologie. Alors, bien sûr, j'ai commencé par l'augmenter. Et puis après, je l'ai enlevé parce que l'imputabilité faisait que. On a déclaré ça. Et alors, pour aller un peu plus loin sur, ton, sur, ton, sur ta remarque de tout à l'heure, est-ce que à quoi ça sert Il faudrait peut-être, ou ce que vous disiez, il faudrait peut-être en nominatif ces, ces évaluations pour qu'il puisse y avoir un screening un peu plus complet, justement, et un peu plus précis. Je ne sais pas si ça marcherait. En tout cas, là, il m'a été demandé de renvoyer un compte rendu hospitalier par l'agence avec laquelle on a déclaré via la pharmacie de l'établissement dans lequel je travaille. Il m'a été demandé de renvoyer un compte rendu hospitalier un peu plus précis pour qu'il puisse évaluer euh, qu'est-ce qu'il faisait de cette déclaration. Voilà, je voulais juste partager cette expérience-là. Et je me posais toujours la question, je me posais toujours la question, est-ce que c'est est -ce que est quelque chose que je referai ou pas Dans la mesure, est-ce que, est que ce sera traité ou pas Je vois l'affaire Mediator qui a été beaucoup médiatisée euh, dans ces dernières années. On a bien vu à quel point la NSM était vraiment pas en mesure de traiter ces informations dans certaines situations Est-ce que ça va changer Enfin voilà, c'était ce genre de débat que j'aurais aimé avoir un peu. Voilà. So Bertrand, who is a child psychiatrist, spoke about one of his patients who had anorexia nervosa. And um, since she looked depressed, she was put under some antidepressant treatment. And uh, she developed a delusional ideas, um, which were evocative of melancholia which would be recurring over the next three months when one of the nurses said, couldn't the antidepressant be the cause? And Bertrand had a look at the dates when things happened and said, mm, that looks quite a good idea, considering that the paper with the drug treatment says it can happen that people deteriorate. He even said that at one, at one point he increased the, the dose. And he decided to stop her patient's treatment with antidepressants and then the delusional state stopped. So he decided to report this to the pharmacovigilance and he was wondering, um, he was interested by the fact that you mentioned that uh, it has to be with the name of the patient so the patient can be cross-examined. But um, he was asked by the, the institution responsible for pharmacovigilance to give a report um, about the uh, stay of her patient in the hospital. But he was wondering whether this could be of any consequence or not later, considering that we've heard of the Mediator story recently, which seems to show that sometimes people report serious side effects, but nothing really seems to come out of that. When you report to EMA, usually, at least in the UK, there's no name of the patient on it. The report just goes into their file, and they can have thousands of reports, and nothing happens. And what we, I mean, it's not really the job of the regulator to decide, does the drug cause a problem? If you've got a child who's got this kind of problem, and you've seen what's happened, you may be reporting to a person who's in EMA who may have done medicine, but you know they did orthopedic surgery. They didn't do child psychiatry. They're in EMA because they don't like meeting people. Um, you know, they're not in a position to actually decide. The fact that we look to EMA or FDA to uh, decide these things for us is where we've gone wrong. Back, you know, when I put up the slide of the patient becoming invisible. That was the moment where Lilly persuaded people that the evidence that counts is their controlled trials, not the anecdotes about your patient. Up till 1990, our major journals took reports like yours where you have a named doctor at least, okay? And, you know, what you didn't think then was that you might be asked into court to be cross-examined. But this was good medical evidence. No journal, no major journal takes case reports like that these days. And that's where medical evidence used to come from. And we need to get back to a situation where our major journals take a report like this, ideally with the name of the patient, and ideally, I mean, obviously you can't do this if the patient and their family aren't happy, but ideally with your name and their name on it. That becomes the kind of data where if similar things happen to other patients and they end up wanting to take a legal action or whatever, you know, they can say, well, look, this is real evidence. 
Whereas if, the, if you report it to EMA, the courts will view the report to EMA as hearsay. They will not take it into account. So there's something there that we have to change. I'm not exactly sure what we do, whether we need to have journals that have more case reports or what, I'm not exactly sure, but that's a key point. The fact that our names have gone missing is a key point. Did you experience already such uh, uh, side effect by antidepressant drugs, such as uh, uh, kind of melancholia, uh, uh, pro, uh, favored by, by the drug, uh, provoked by the drug? Sure. There is no question. If you look at uh, the label of the SSRIs, they say they can cause psychosis. They've, they, they've had, I mean, the company, not the regulator, the regulator doesn't write the label, the company writes the label. And the company will often feel obliged if you report, I mean, it seems odd. The companies are encourage us now to report these problems to EMA and FDA, and everybody thinks that's good, because we can't depend on these nasty pharmaceutical companies. We can depend on the regulators who are independent. In fact, the companies are doing this because they're under a legal obligation if you report to them to chase you and your patient's medical record. And they often, um, you know, they're looking for things in the medical record that will help them explain away the problem. But when they can't find this, they often conclude and include it in the label that our drug can cause psychosis, for instance. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, ask again the question I was just asking you before when you were interrupted. So if I understand well, you said that SSRIs have never been shown in RCT to have more than a marginally uh, better outcome than a placebo. So they're not very useful drugs. One can say that, right? Uh, for that, that's the first step. And then you'll tell me if, if you'll agree. So how on a public, from a public health point of view, could, you, could a doctor ever justify to prescribe them knowing that they can have, even if it's one case in a million, they can have such serious side effects as severe uh, um, definitive anhedonia and loss of sexual function? I, there's something I don't see. C'est la question de la de la balance entre les bénéfices et les risques quand il y a des risques aussi énormes que de perdre la fonction sexuelle définitivement et un bénéfice thérapeutique qui paraît être modeste, comment est-ce qu'un médecin peut accepter de prescrire ce genre de médicament Ok, well, when uh, the oral contraceptives get brought on the market during the 1960s they caused, and still I mean they caused even more then but still cause now deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolus in young women The response when this um, came on the radar first was a lot of people linked to uh, the pharmaceutical industry saying, no, this isn't happening. And a lot of people who are, for various reasons, anti the idea of oral contraceptives saying, nobody should be having these drugs anyway. And there is a middle ground, which is recognizing the risks, but saying women should have the freedom to take risks. It's not the role of the Pope, or it's not the role of the pharmaceutical industry to dictate whether people take these things or not, knowing or not knowing the risks. It's, it's, it's a case of knowing the risks and leaving up to, it up to the people who might take an SSRI or Accutane, which can cause sexual problems, or Propecia for hair loss, which can cause permanent sexual problems. You know, these can be terribly distressing states. You hope people don't take these drugs for minor problems, and you hope that they don't um, take the drugs without being told what the full range of risks are, but it's not my role to tell people, no, you shouldn't have them. You know, my role is to help you solve your problem, and maybe to try and steer you towards not taking the drug because you don't have a uh, per 
particularly severe problem are, are that you haven't been told that there are other ways to treat this other than with drugs, but it's not my role to decide your choices for you. I can interact with you and help shape things, but, but at the end of the day, it's your call. Well, well, this is, I, I think, think a question, question for, for the entire room. room. Not just a question for me. Um, does anyone else want to contribute on this one? Yeah. Yeah. Comment c'est du point de vue de la santé publique, comment on peut justifier que des personnes, que des personnes choisissent de prendre ce risque, sachant qu'il va y avoir un coût après extrême ou un, un bénéfice potentiellement, enfin, souvent nul. Uh, yes. yes, this is a question about the size of the benefit. If there is no benefit, you don't have any ratio for using such drug at the population scale. But in general, <coughs> you put on the market drugs uh, from which you expect some benefit, even if it's not very large. Let me add to this a little bit, and this may make things a bit more interesting. If we were to ban the SSRIs, Right? Well, in actual fact, people can get SSRIs over the counter. A lot of antihistamines are serotonin reuptake inhibitors that produce exactly the same anxiolytic effect that an SSRI will uh, actually produce. And when people get these drugs over the counter, when things don't feel right, they don't continue with the treatment. It's often the doctor who traps the person into treatment. Okay, so we've got a tricky issue here. We've got a, the relationship that most of us get is critical to things working out right is part of the problem as things stand. It's, it's as much us who, who is injuring people as the pills. I mean, it's, uh, medicine is a chemical plus information. The chemicals are always risky. We could say we should have no 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 chemicals, but we don't say that. We leave a lot of chemicals like alcohol and tobacco and antihistamines available for you to take as you see fit. And the key thing there is you often decide once you've had the first pill or whatever, these things don't suit me and you stop having them. You know, your relationship with me, if I give you an SSRI, should be one where I support you to make that call. But none of us can take the risks away completely. And when we live in this world, we uh, decide to take risks. Um, can I ask you a personal question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a kind of exercise. I, 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 I'm getting used more and more with students, uh, making them uh, express what is their own level of preference regarding a preventive treatment uh, supposed to prevent, for example, stroke, which is in general uh, an, an accident we want to, to prevent, um, and uh, asking to, to, the, uh, to the individuals w which has their own level for uh, giving a treatment on a daily basis without any side effect. Some treat, sometimes uh, we, we, we feel that the treatment has no effect on our uh, feelings, etc., and on our comfort of life. Uh, so uh, what would be your uh, requirement to take such a treatment, daily treatment, in terms of number needed to treat, for example, for a five-year or ten-year uh, duration of the treatment? Would that be... Uh, 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 one in thousand, one in hundred, one in ten, one in five, uh, or five people needed to treat to uh, prevent uh, a stroke, or hundred uh, people needed to treat, etc. Do, do you do you know what is your own level of requirement to take such pill? Yeah, I don't. Um, 
I don't take any drugs uh, to prevent risks, as things stand. Um, but, you know, I think things, you know, it's a bit like um, uh, your father dies. You don't know what you feel about your father till he dies, if you see what I mean. Then you find you're terribly emotional. Well, when you put, get put into a situation that you have a heart attack or a stroke, that's a very different situation to going along to the doctor who says, I mean, where you're fit and healthy like you, and uh, you're the doctor says, well, you've got a little raised cholesterol, and I think you should be taking this drug, and puts pressure on you to take it. So, you know, it's a different emotional situation, and, I, and I've learned enough about myself to know, well, you've got to be put into the situation that you have a cancer, for instance, and maybe you can live with it, or, well, there is a treatment that might save some day, you, you might get some extra days if you take the treatment, and which is the best bet to have a maybe better quality of life without the treatment or of a few weeks longer on the treatment. These are terribly difficult choices. Mm. Thank you for your, your lack of answer. <laughs> uh, okay, so, but, but I, I think this is a very interesting exercise and uh, my conclusion is that some people are expecting a very low level of benefit to decide to, to be treated and some others on the reverse uh, expect very high benefit and uh, completely absurd benefit in terms of uh, and and in, in uh, 30 people uh, there are always people uh, of both extremes very low benefit to to make the decision and very high benefit expected to make a decision and most of people are between 1% and 10% yeah. as an expectation. That's it. And I feel that this exercise is rather simple, but never done in terms of uh, uh, making patients express their own preference in terms of uh, level of risk reduction to, to make a decision. Euh, on va probablement s'arrêter. Euh, merci à tous d'être venus et d'avoir assisté à cette présentation. Thank you very much, David, um, for reminding us that uh, part of the art of a, lot, a great part of the art of medicine is about using poisons something we don't really like to think about. <coughs> oh. A great quote. Um, une, une grande citation de Pinel, le grand psychiatre, qui dit que c'est un grand art de manier les poisons, mais c'est un art encore plus... Les médicaments, les poisons, que la médecine, est donc l'art de manier les poisons, mais que c'est un art encore plus grand de savoir quand s'en passer, ne pas prescrire. Et, euh, et j'espère aussi que pour... Euh, mais mes étudiants psychologues, vous avez vu à quel point, les... en fait, il y a une dimension psychologique autour de cette question de prescrire ou pas prescrire et de comment, dans quelle situation on fait le choix de prendre ou de ne pas prendre un médicament et, et comment la relation entre peut-être le médecin et le malade est peut-être amenée à évoluer compte tenu du fait qu'on a de plus en plus accès à l'information les uns et, et les autres et pas forcément la même information. Relation-based medicine, yes, that's the future. Thank you again. <laughs>